in no special order. Actually, I'm not really even going to introduce them all. I'm going to get people to introduce themselves. Um, are we all there? Excellent. So, very disparate companies this year. Um, in, in many ways, coming from, you know, basically kind of online security to uh, biomed to, to issues of global warming. We're going to be touching on all of it. Um, I'm going to ask you actually in the order that you're sitting because it's going to be easier for me mentally. So since Scott, you're sitting right next to me, why don't you kick us off? Introduce yourself. Tell us what NanoVision does. I'm Scott Thorogood. I'm chairman. Oh, we're not hearing that. Sorry. Just say it again. Scott Thorogood. There we go. Uh, chairman and CEO of NanoVision. We're in uh, La Jolla, California. And we started the company six years ago to uh, basically restore vision to, to blind people. And we have a nano-engineered retinal prosthesis. And um, the idea here is obviously an implant to go in the back of the eye. It will fix things like macular degeneration, which are obviously essentially incurable conditions right now. So the potential transformative effect for this, you know, in, in health terms around the world with an aging population is gigantic, right? It's huge. Yeah, there's no cure for it. And uh, we also have a non-biological division that's focused on night vision and, and low light imaging. And you have, um, and these are implants, they cost how much? It'll be about $150,000 for the implant. And it's designed to go in the eye subretinally and it basically restores the signal back to the brain that you lose when your rods and cones die with certain retinal diseases. So um, surgeons will get a little rule book uh, yep. and a piece of kit and they just sew it into your optic nerve? They, it sews in subretinally and the optic nerve is connected to the, the retina. And how, that, soon, how soon are surgeons going to be starting their operations on this? How soon will we, we will be in the human? In about 18 months. 18 months yeah. from now. And we finished all of our animal studies, and we know now that the, that the, we know when the rods and cones have, have died and there's no signal in the brain, when we introduce our device into the retina, we're stimulating the neurons, and we measure cortically that we have a positive uh, result. So we know the device is actually reintroducing the, the lost signal to the brain. The next step, obviously, is to get, I mean, obviously, you can't talk to... Uh, rabbits very well. They don't talk back. Pigs. So get into a human and see what they're So rabbits and pigs have had this done to them so far? Yep. Yep. And, and, and you're doing human trials yet? 18 months. In 18 months? Yeah. In the U U.S. or? Ex-U.S. Uh, outside of the U.S.? Yeah. My uh, partner who's a surgeon trains a lot of surgical fellows and they've offered to, to be the first. Obviously it's a pretty prestigious event and they would like to be part of that. Terrific. Our next, Bill. Hi. Uh, good morning. I'm Bill Stoward. I'm the CEO of Titan Seal. Uh, we are using the blockchain to digitally certify uh, government records, other important documents and credentials. Um, we basically you take a PDF, you drag it into our application, we create a unique cache uh, of the document, uh, we timestamp it, we understand who, the, who is the original author of the document, uh, we create a receipt and we put the receipt out on the blockchain. And we're starting initially, our, our first use cases are with uh, counties. Uh, our first live customer uh, is uh, Washoe County in Nevada, which is Reno. And they're using us initially for copies of marriage certificates. So a citizen comes in, asks for a copy of their marriage certificate. Uh, we digitize it and then it's able to, to be emailed off to the uh, citizen and they now have the instant response from their government as well as portability of that document. They take it to whoever was requesting a copy of that uh, and then that recipient uh, sees the digital version instead of paper. The reason why this is really important, we think, um, is that um, you know, the, the, last, the last mile from a, a government standpoint, uh, the, all the key documents today are still paper-based. We think government entities would like to move to digital uh, originals as well as copies. Um, they haven't been able to do that because there's been no secure way to, uh, to digitize without the document being tamper-proof. And of course, their, their role is to make sure that this document is for real. Um, and so uh, we really brought the first application to them where they can use this as the way to solve that last problem 
and then start moving more aggressively towards digitization. And if you think about there's other people that are talking about um, you know, owning your own data, having an electronic wallet with all your key credentials, that's all going to happen. But what's going to be supplying the wallet? Where are the documents coming from? The documents come from governments, they come from banks, whatever, uh, institutions. And so we're working on the government and institutional side to get those documents digitized in a secure way so that we can then move towards the next you know, huge rollout of more personal credentials and, and uh, you know, doing everything in a much more secure way. So that's our, that's our business. Our first customer, Washoe County, Reno. We're gonna be going live shortly with our second key customer, which is one of the top 15 counties in the United States. Uh, and they're gonna be doing it for all of their real estate documents. So we're working with Vital Records, marriage certificates, and then the next step, birth certificates and death certificates, and also on the real estate side, all of the documents there, liens, titles, reconveyances, whatever, we're doing all of that. Terrific, Alex? Hi, uh, I'm Alex Canaris, I'm the CEO of Polyverse Corporation. Uh, we're a cybersecurity firm that does a technology known as moving target defense. And I can explain this probably the simplest by starting with a question. Uh, maybe show of hands, how many folks flew here today? Okay, did you feel scared getting in the airplane? Probably not. You sort of think about, you know, all of us are diverse as humans. Imagine if we all had the same DNA, right? If there was a sick person on the plane, you would not have made it here. As a species, we would have been wiped out by the bubonic plague, Spanish flu, you know, zombie apocalypse. Choose your favorite. You know, if all of us were clones of each other. So our diversity as humans, you know, and as a biological species gives us strength. But now you think about computers, I see a lot of computers out here, they're all Macs or Windows. Guess what, Russians have the exact same computer you do. Chinese have the exact same computer you do. Same, same with North Koreans, Syrians, choose your favorite bad actor. And the computing world is very much a monoculture. Your computer is identical to everything else, they're, they're clones of each other. And so as the attacker, you know, if I'm, if I'm a, you know, a Russian agent or, or in the Chinese PLA, if I find one bug, one exploit, I can take over a billion computers. So the economics greatly favor the attackers. So the solution is actually fairly simple. It's called moving target defense. Instead of having identical copies of all your computers, make them all unique. And that's what we do. We make every computer that you have that's protected by Polyverse unique all the way down to the binary level. Works the same, performs the same. You can't tell the difference as the good person in the world, but to the attackers, it's a completely uh, novel computer they've never seen before. If you haven't seen it, you can't attack it. Uh, so my final sort of you know, punchline is, don't use the same stuff the Russians have. <laughs> Do something different. How easy is it to stick Polyverse whatever it is, software, onto an individual computer? Uh, it takes a couple seconds, it's a one command line install. It's super, super easy to install. We, we literally do it by creating um, uh, a Linux app store. And we just have our own instead of the standard one. So it's like the Apple App Store or the Windows Update. We just have one of our own, and every time you do an update, you get a new one. And so it's a randomly generated set of characteristics that you just- Exactly, completely randomly generated. Every last bit of binary. Wow, okay, um, we're gonna come back, no doubt, to all of this, and I'm getting a, there's a, there's a strong cyber security uh, theme I'm sensing coming along. Who do, who do I have next? I can't even see, hi. Uh, John Strumling with Clean Fiber, and so stepping out of the cyber world yeah. for a second into the physical world, there's a bag of insulation on the table out there. We're gonna talk about building insulation for just a minute, and I'm gonna talk about what we do, why it matters, and, and why we believe we can be quite successful. So what we do is we make high-performance building insulation from recycled corrugated cardboard boxes. Most of you are familiar with fiberglass and foam. Uh, many of you may be familiar with cellulose insulation, which is a paper-based insulation that's typically blown into walls or attics. It's a high-performance insulation that insulates very well, um, and, and it's used in place of fiberglass if you care, if you care about keeping heat or if you care about uh, high thermal efficiency in either hot or cold climates. Um, it's used in place of foam because it's far safer, it's far more cost effective. Um, why does this matter? Well, it turns out if you look at our overall energy usage, 47% uh, of the energy use in your home is to keep yourself warm or cold across the country. So it's a big number. And it turns out this is low hanging fruit. So by 
putting cellulose in a home that used to be insulated with fiberglass, you can save 26 to 38 percent of the heat. You can cut the entire home's energy usage by 10, 10 percent or more. We do this across the country. It's a big deal. Now, this has not been successful historically because the availability of cellulose has been limited by the availability of newsprint. All of our competitors make the product for newsprint. People have tried for decades to make it out of corrugated. It's technically challenging, and nobody had been able to figure out how to do it. So what, what we enable is the growth of this industry, to take it from a niche industry to a mainstream industry, and to meaningfully impact our nation's uh, carbon emissions and energy usage. We estimate our first plant, which is literally less than a $10 million investment, is going to save homeowners a billion dollars over the first 10 years. And that translates into energy savings and global warming. Uh, why will we, we be successful? Um, we have a patented technology that allows us to put a safe fire retardant into the fiber instead of on the outside of the fibers. Uh, this material is, is, is safe enough that our COO will actually demonstrate eating it for people. Uh, I, I don't like the taste of it personally. Uh, but it is not going to kill you. It doesn't have formaldehyde in it as, formaldehyde, as uh, fiberglass does. It doesn't have um, VOCs in it or other contaminants that foam would have. It's much safer. It's cost effective. We can make this a big, wide rollout. So that's a little bit about what we do. And I'll just add at the end that I'm a serial entrepreneur. This is the third business I launched. I was the last question for that guy, uh, for the ambassador from the Ukraine last time. And I had a team in Ukraine in my last business. Um, and having sat there and watched uh, uh, colleagues who, who were a block from those shootings in Ukraine during that week, I can, I can tell you that we in this country just take for granted the freedoms that we have, and it's an entirely different thing to have your CTO say to you, I just watched my people stand up in the face of gunfire for our freedom. So I would just say, we should be asking that guy, what can we do to help? And that was my comment, which I didn't get quite <laughs> to say last time, but it's meaningful, and, and that's what we should be doing for the Ukraine right now. So. On, on, back to you, Ed. <laughs> well, to you, Denise. Yeah, thank you. I'm Denise Heyman Loa. I'm the CEO of Kari. And what we have developed is a full social networking platform that enables organizations to really link together their disparate members. So, how does that work? I mean, if you think about the current world right now, all of the communications in the social world are all very fra uh, uh, fragmented and siloed. And it's very difficult to make sure messaging is happening, to make sure it's controlled, to make sure that it can be in a private and data-owned manner. So if you think about now, you're using email and Facebook and LinkedIn and Slack and Eventbrite and GoToMeeting and all of these platforms, right? So what we've created is a fully integrated solution that brings all of those capabilities into a completely branded, owned environment where our clients own their own data, own their own brand, and it can truly engage with their disparate members. And a, an example is one of our clients is a company called Goodlink. And what they do is they link nonprofits with businesses providing services to those nonprofits. And we've enabled their whole digital environment to exist, that it provide an environment for the nonprofits to interact, to get knowledge, to get services from the businesses. And we've also are integrating blockchain into that solution because we're giving them the ability to transact with each other and then it'll go out to the blockchain. So you're creating communities which, by their nature, seek to be private or semi-private. I mean, that is presumably the, the, the key issue here, isn't it, for, for the people who are your customers? It's a mixture. Um, Goodlink is actually a public site, so they're marketing out to the public world. Our other client, the ANA, which is the Association of National Advertisers, they wanted a private community for all of their CMOs to engage with each other, to take action. We're also working with some projects related to the UN with the SDGs, and in that case, it's much more of an outgoing outreach kind of situation. We're able to integrate both worlds. But that is why, I mean, to ask a slightly dumb question, I did put this to you yesterday, but why they're not, you, they would choose you rather than create their own little Facebook group or a WhatsApp <laughs> group. Yeah, well, that's a longer answer. Yeah. Uh, the short answer is, do you trust Facebook? No. <laughs> Precisely. So it's a trust factor more than anything, but there's a lot of functionality that goes into that as well. Yeah. David. Uh, hi, I'm David Binger. I'm the CTO of a company called Force Physics. Um, we, are, uh, we have a, a heat removal technology um, that we're uh, bringing to the data center market. Um, and what it does is it allows data center servers the heat from them to be removed uh, from the data center 
um, without the need for chilling air in advance. So the compression cooling and the evaporative cooling that are currently used in data centers um, will no longer be necessary and uh, the, the heat, um, which is quite a bit of heat around the world, uh, can be removed to the data centers um, with 90% less energy input for the cooling. Um, this is important because, you know, data centers use about uh, something like 2% of all energy, electrical energy generated in the United States, and a big chunk of that, a third or a half, is used for the cooling component. It amounts to tens of gigawatts of, of power that are used for cooling data centers globally. And so by cutting that by 90%, we're gonna um, have a big impact on carbon emissions uh, globally. Um, and another uh, benefit is our cooling technology operates uh, with outside air only. Um, it doesn't consume any fresh water like most data centers do today. Um, so uh, we, we'll, we'll conserve water um, and we'll uh, save energy and reduce carbon emissions. Just to explain, I'm not going to be able to explain the technology here because I don't fully grasp it either, but I've been talking to your colleague about this mm -hmm. yesterday. The, the essence is a kind of physical principle where essentially if, the, if air molecules are correctly channeled around fixed objects such as extremely hot data centers uh, and all of the, the hot parts within them, uh, you can literally, using existing basic principles of physics, charging, directing the particles correctly, using these high power, just regular blowers, right? Using ordinary air, you will effectively suck the heat out of them um, with 90% greater efficiency. That's right. So it, air has been used for cooling basically forever. And um, the, the ways that you can get more heat out with air have, have been limited to uh, increasing the surface area that's available for the contact between the, the solid surface and the gas, um, and then also uh, increasing the temperature difference that's available at that surface. Um, so the, the invention upon, you know, the part of the IP of force physics is the um, invention of, of, of something that addresses that, uh, that point of contact between the gas and the solid, which, you know, if I was talking about cars, I would say that's where the rubber meets the road. Um, so that's the really critical point where uh, if you can enhance the transfer of kinetic energy into the gas, then you are removing more heat, and um, the benefit is, uh, is there for all of us. Steve Shillingford. Great, so uh, Anonymy Labs was formed by a bunch of ex-cybersecurity folks uh, who were sort of on the, um, depending on your point of view, the wrong side of the data mining market. Uh, I myself uh, sort of a reformed data miner. And uh, we decided to sort of take all that trade craft for surveillance and vacuuming up personals, uh, people's personal information and try to uh, build applications for consumers, normals, um, everyday people, uh, to have more control over how they have to disseminate personally identifiable information. So that's a long way of kind of telling you what our product is called. Uh, the, the app is MySudo, S-U-D-O. It allows you to generate what you could imagine to be a personal proxy for you in the digital world, which if we know the notion of proxy, sort of creates this barrier, or at least a, a, a filter between you and engagements with sort of those big faceless platforms that want to know everything about you, or just that person that you want to uh, sell your sofa to on Craigslist. And the app gives you uh, the capability to not have to share sort of uh, all those digital tattoos we've accumulated over the world or over, over time uh, and, and you know, create a little bit of control and compartmentalization when you're sort of navigating the digital world. And uh, we've been in business for about four years. We have you know, a million and a half of these floating around the world doing various things, whether it's shopping or selling or just you know, socializing. And your customers are normals, as you put it. We, 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 we do have the, the technophile um, 
uh, I, I lovingly call them nerds. You know, they're very sort of into it, but uh, we actually have a lot of folks who are, you know, stay-at-home moms, um, self-employed folks who have different types of jobs. Uh, the sharing economy folks are big users of the app. And not so much stay-at-home drug dealers or... Not stay-at-home drug dealers. We've, as I said, our background has been in kind of finding those folks and, and hunting them down. And so we designed the system and the platform in such a way that we at Anonymy can never sort of unmask, to use a term that we're all familiar with now, uh, any individual. But the information that we provide and the information that, let's say, law enforcement could get from our platform providers like Apple or Google or, let's say, Verizon, it's kind of like the two keys to the missile. So we've built in a little bit of process there so that the unmasking is not unilateral or um, within any one group's control. But it's possible. But it is possible. Um, I am going to invite you, any of you right now to stand, if you wish, and ask a question of any of these guys, because um, they all obviously operate in very different spheres. And um, if I come up with generalized questions, they may not apply to everybody. I mean, one thing I, I do think is, is striking is about how three or four of you are all sort of, in different ways, reactions to the data mining thing. Um, uh, Didizio, do you see that is a growth market, right? I mean, for whatever kind of a startup, this is a huge, there is a huge latent consumer hunger for this. For, for, for people who want an antidote to the public realm of what the major social media platforms are, uh, basically force them into. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we see that trend dramatically. We see, first of all, the interest in community in general the people are recognizing the value of community and for engaging people with a common interest or purpose, and that's a big theme we're seeing. But we're also very strongly seeing that desire to manage your own information, to control your environment, to own your data, and it's only getting bigger with GDPR and other initiatives like that around the world. So absolutely. Go ahead, sorry. I think there's an emerging question here about what is authentic whether we're talking about a document, an article, or an individual. And so kind of behind that is how do you know that um, what you're seeing is actually the real thing, that it's the original thing, and that, what you're, you know, and that the person that you're dealing with, uh, you know, what are the credentials that you need to see from them to know that, they're, that that's who they are, are in, the, in the real world. And so I think we're, we're all struggling with authenticity and I do think that some of the things that all of us are working on are, in their own ways are a ways to try to lock that down in a better way, because otherwise, in the absence of that, how do we know what's real, right? Yes, sir. I have a question for Mr. Thorogood. Uh, how does your uh, implant, uh, how does it compare to a human retina for like uh, resolution and color perception and things like that? Well, the first, uh, can we have my mic on? Yeah. Okay. In fact, there was an image they might they were going to put up on the screen oh. that would help. And then Do we have an image? To, there we have it. There you go. So when you have a retina, retinal disease, you lose the rods and cones, which are the top left. And when that happens, the light comes in, nothing happens. You can see the, excuse me. That's better. You can see the... Uh, the experience that the person has with the, you know, the black spot in the in their vision, and so we've uh, we've uh, engineered a basically 130,000 nanowire retinal implant, which are prosthetic rods and cones, and each nanowire is about one one hundredth the diameter of a human hair. They're photosensitive. They generate a charge, and they stimulate the the remaining inner retina that doesn't die when you get these diseases. That's connected to the optic nerve that goes to the brain. So top right, you can see the signal being sent back to the cortex. And if you go to the top left, when the rods and cones are gone, there is no signal. There's no phototransduction. So our first device, 130,000 nanowires, we're targeting 2,200 visual acuity. We have another device in the lab that's going to get it down to about 2,050 visual acuity. So it's pretty dramatic. It's probably going to be grayscale initially. We're not going to really know until we actually talk to a patient. You know, that, that's the key. But we do know in our animal studies that 
were successfully top right picture, taking photons, generating, you know, stimulating neurons and getting a signal in the cortex. And so we don't know what the rabbits are, and pigs are seeing. We just have to get into a human now. Will night vision come as standard? That'd be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> Interestingly, these nanowires do, they do uh, respond. They're multispectral. So if you give it an infrared stimulus, it generates a charge which stimulates the neurons. So we're going to find out about that too. Yes, sir. Uh, this question is for uh, David of Force Physics. Uh, can you um, repeat the uh, percentage of electricity consumption that we attribute to data centers in the U.S.? Uh, I believe it's around 2%. Climbing, I assume. Uh, yes, the data centers are being built at, a, at an unbelievable rate. Basically, all the companies are building as, as fast as they possibly can, sure. especially in places like Ashburn, Virginia, where um, there, it's just a big construction site and every available piece of land, basically. Sure. All right. So my question is, thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, so you're, you're extracting, capturing uh, huge, huge amounts of heat. Um, this, 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 and maybe, forgive me if I missed it in your talk, but it seems like a chance for reuse. We, uh, this like, sort of like a cogeneration plant. Is any, are you or anybody on your team looking at doing good things, uh, perhaps feeding electricity back into the data center that you captured, taking the heat out of the data center, anything like that? Uh, yes, we've looked at that, um, but we're, we're leaving that opportunity for our customers and integrators to pick up later on. Um, because the complexity of what we're doing as a business is already uh, large for a startup. But um, when you get to temperatures in the range of 150, 160 output, there is an opportunity for recovering a, a, enough of the waste heat um, to generate power. So we expect that hyperscale customers in particular will be interested in, in that opportunity as well. Thank you. Um, Alex, you, uh, I mean, I just, I don't know, is it, do you have anything more to say about in that world of where we are, again, in terms of a market? Has the market in the world changed? Have perceptions changed? Obviously, the world of cybersecurity has been one that's been, you know, obsessing people for many years now, but in the, in the kind of post-Facebook scandals and everything else, does, does, has, that, has that galvanized you as a startup? Has that, has that accelerated the process with which there's been a an appetite for what you're offering. Yeah, it certainly has, has helped. Uh, you know, Equifax was uh, a boon for many of us because that was, you know, just a straight, the attackers came in, knocked over the web server, and took all the data. Uh, and it was even worse than that. It was data that they had about you that you never gave them permission for. It. So there's, there's sort of a, a double, double set of issues there. Um, but we do, you know, I think as a society, we run the risk of being complacent as well. I think that is a, a challenge we see in the marketplace. It's like, well, Equifax got hacked, you know, Anthem got hacked, Sony got hacked. Well, yeah, we got hacked too. So what? Um, that doesn't change the damage that happens to consumers and, and individuals and nations, for that matter. Jonathan, I want to pick up one thing that you said, um, uh, which you probably put into your talk, but I'm not sure if it came across totally clearly. You are basically saying your competitive advantage, I suppose, right now in offering this type of insulation is because the world is more awash with waste cardboard than it is with waste paper right now. And you can, so therefore your raw material is more abundant and cheaper. Yeah, no, I, I always joke that it used to be when you opened your door, you saw a newspaper, but that's not what you see anymore. So, so there's certainly no shortage of newsprint. It's the largest recycling stream in, in the country. There's 30 million tons recycled every year. There's less than three of newsprint today. And there's, there's ample resources that we could, I mean, we could insulate literally every, every house in the country with the resources we could tap. So, so there's, a, there's an enormous opportunity. We can, we can save substantial amounts of money for consumers. We actually, will re we are the lowest cost way to keep your house warm or cool. Uh, fiberglass is cheaper maybe at first cost in certain installations, but you're gonna recover that savings within a year or two. It's very, very quick in terms of it's a very slight differential. In many cases, with the fact that codes have tightened, cellulose is already cheaper. So I always say, people say, what's the cheapest form of insulation? I say, no insulation. It just doesn't work, right? So they, you know, it depends where you set codes. If you set codes low, sometimes you can meet it with fiberglass, but then you're gonna, you're, you're literally gonna, you know, I always say it's throwing energy and it's throwing carbon out the window or out the walls of your buildings 
um, with bad insulation. So what we do is we provide good insulation very, very cost effectively. That's basically the secret sauce. But cellulose uh, from paper, that industry already exists, right? I mean, so that's... cellulose from newsprint exists. It's existed for decades, and people have tried to make a good product out of, out of corrugated cardboard for decades. Come see me afterwards if you want to understand how we do it, which is different. But it's, it's, a, it's some magic in our chemistry as well as in our physical processing, and we've got a patented way to make a high-performance cellulose out of a product, which nobody's been able to make one out of before. Yes, sir. Hi, questions for David and Alex, just about the, um, the progress in taking your inventions to market. Can you talk about what, what valid customer experience you have or market validation or when you will be in the market and with what kind of companies? Um, Force Physics is building uh, pilot scale uh, uh, structures now, um, containerized uh, systems, small systems. Um, that we'll be deploying in, uh, in, in demonstration projects. Um, so that's the status. And for us, we are um, uh, thankfully just growing incredibly rapidly. We have uh, over 100 customers. We do a lot with banking, insurance, as you might imagine, a lot with the military. So we protect weapon systems, drones, uh, and a whole bunch of stuff I can't talk about in this forum. Um, we do a couple million Linux builds a day in growing. Uh, we're actually so big now, we've broken Amazon uh, from our scale, not once, not twice, but four times now. Um, so even Amazon has trouble keeping up with us in our growth. Alex, what are you doing here? Uh, <laughs> I will have some calls to do afterwards. <laughs> no one else? Right. So, I mean, just tell us a bit more then about those customers. You've got, uh, basically, they tend to be the large, obviously, institutional, because those are the guys who, uh, you, 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 would larger corporations have a, have a value for this? Because uh, I guess if they are and they're under regular attack or they feel themselves to be, they will want your, your software on all of their laptops uh, around a corporation. Right, yeah, so we, we find our, you know, particularly as a startup, uh, where we have a very, very strong cyber defense, you know, we got our early start with uh, customers that cared about security. Um, and that would be, you know, the military intelligence community and so forth. And, you know, based on the success they had with that, it just has exploded from there. Um, okay. But anybody that cares about security you ought, to, ought to get our stuff. Yeah, one more question for you, actually. You were talking about these, these, these documents, the documents that are getting pinged around. And the, the fact that most Americans are still using paper documentation, right? For, for does this, I mean, the, the now emailable, I don't know, marriage certificate, birth certificate, whatever it might be, is that is that ultimately going to be a more reliable item? Do you think than the paper piece of paper that they're going to that someone will wave around when they go to an office? Um, it's it's quite possible because uh, it's not just the document itself; it's also who created it, when they created it, having an audit trail, making it easily verifiable. And so paper doesn't have any of those attributes. And you know, the US Treasury has made it very difficult to counterfeit money, but it can still be done. Um, other documents don't have anywhere near that level of protection. And so it's getting easier and easier, I think, to, to you know, replicate some of these documents. And I think the concerns about fraud are going up. So ultimately, a, a digital approach uh, with all of the other security built in around it, may well be a, you know, a better solution. And your current customer base is, uh, <clears throat> is, is what, cities or counties, counties or right. whatever? I mean, what about the finance industry? I mean, is there a private sector? Yeah, I mean, I think, appeal? you know, we, we've chosen deliberately to start with public sector because they control so many documents and those are strategic documents for everything else. Uh, and they're quite open to this because of their own internal issues with paper. Um, but certainly, <clears throat> you know, if you look at it from an individual standpoint, um, if I'm going through different life events, raising money, whatnot, um, buying a house, you know, I, I may need an em uh, employee verification. Um, you know, uh, I might need to prove my current address that I live at this place. Um, you know, how much money is in my account? All of these things are documents uh, that come into play that could easily be digitized and certified and then keep them in your wallet and then as you go around doing different things you're able to produce them and 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 go from there so they the, the these are consumer applications from that perspective 
And one final question. Everybody is talking about blockchain almost everywhere, almost <coughs> all the time right now. Um, and it's uh, uh, every time as a journalist I find myself talking about it, I always have to devote the first two minutes to reminding people, and indeed myself, what exactly we're talking about. But, but I mean, getting back to the, in your sphere, are you up against 50 competitors offering the same product? No. Um, first of all, I mean, most of blockchain hype is around the, the currency, the cryptocurrency, and we steer clear of that. We use the infrastructure. And each successive generation of infrastructure that's coming out there, first with Bitcoin, then Ethereum, uh, Stellar, and others, makes it more and more robust and more scalable. So, you know, we're just leveraging the technology, the infrastructure, not getting into the currency wars and all of that. So uh, then, because of that, there are, there are certainly a number of companies that are looking at blockchain-based applications. Um, and so it's quite possible that we'll see others. Uh, the ones that have shown up so far are more focused on a particular vertical. Um, you know, we view our solution as being a, a document agnostic. It can work on anything, right? And so um, it's a different way to, uh, to attack the market. Denise, I saw you n nodding in that uh, exchange. I mean, some of, these, some of this tech is obviously very bespoke and very um, technical. How, in, in your case, you're offering effectively a platform. Yeah. How, how easy is that going to be as a thing to protect? When you presumably you're up against the likes of well Google and Facebook who are constantly spinning out all kinds of you know different types of products for for corporations and others like like you're targeting, how how, how can you protect your idea I suppose yeah. in this in this environment? Well, I think we we're I mean we've been doing this for about five years now. We have a very robust platform. We have patented technology that's our affiliation technology that allows you to create organic ecosystems of connected communities that no one else has figured out. I mean, Google Plus kind of tried to do that, and obviously, given that they've shut it down, uh, that didn't go so well. So Good for you, though, presumably. Good for us, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think because we have built a completely robust platform, it's available on the web, it's available on mobile, mobile apps, it's available globally, we've already got a number of use cases, and we have some very unique elements in the technology, such as our matching technology, which allows referral networks and matching between buyers and sellers, and then the integration with the blockchain, where we become the user experience element of the blockchain, because as someone mentioned, the blockchain is very siloed. There's very unique apps for different things, but it's not very user-friendly. It's not very normal for normals. <laughs> and so what we provide is a consistent experience that people can tap into the blockchain without even knowing that they're really doing it, because it's a user experience that's friendly to them. And how tough is it to, to build a name? I mean, given the dominance of, of, the, of the famous names of the platforms in, you know, in this space. Yeah, well, we've, we've been very capital efficient in what we've done. Um, we've invested mostly our own money in this. It's been, uh, we've got some ways that we've built the platform very efficiently. Um, it hasn't been easy to get the name out. Uh, that generally takes you know, a lot more money than we've invested in terms of marketing, but I'm pretty proud of what we have accomplished given our budget because we're in front of some of the biggest companies in the world. I mean, our client, the ANA, the clients that are using our technology, the people that are using our technology are the thousand chief marketing officers of some of the biggest companies in the world. And we're also working with a, a bank policy institute client where they're gonna be using our technology for all the CEOs of all the largest banks and insurance companies at their FinTech festival. So, and we're involved with the UN and we're, we've managed to insinuate ourselves um, through networking, through follow-up, through magic, I guess, um, in some situations which normally a small startup wouldn't be involved with. So now we need to mine those and tap into those and expand And again, those. that kind of niche demand that we were discussing, which is that perhaps has just crept up on, on us all, which is the, the incredible hunger for something like that. Really. Yep, exactly. I mean, everywhere I turn, there's, oh, wow, yeah, I'd like that. Oh, I need that. So you know, we just, we need to maximize the strength of our team so that we can deliver for everybody. Okay, guys, I think we might call a halt unless there are any further questions, which there appear not to be right now. Um, obviously, if you have any questions for any of uh, our fire starters, fire starters, please address those in the breaks, and they are around, of course, and they're available through the... Uh, through the uh, the fire email system speak to you soon